boom, let's go. Fuck it. Uh, second episode mm-hmm. of Chap Cross Hooked. Super psyched to be doing this again. <clears throat> Thanks so much for joining me, brother. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, dude. Oh, man. Uh, we had, it's been quite a week, right? Like, uh, in terms of things like that have gone week. down in the MMA world. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I think personal shocker for me was uh, Rene Derrida becoming double champ by dethroning a former double champ. Uh, I don't think we've really seen things like that work out in UFC, right? Like where... Yeah, exactly. One, <laughs> one double champ. Yeah. There's double champs beating double champs now, man. I've seen it all. And um, I mean, that I think he did that. It's, uh, the first fight was amazing in the sense that you know, he actually mm-hmm. made it look almost easy. Like, you know, and you can't just uh, take Angla and Sung like that lightly. But he, And this guy's a veteran. He's had so many fights out of him. He's had many notable wins. Mm-hmm. And... He still managed to choke him out as he was his fight. And I think his record is more like, I think, 14 unbeaten fights? 14? 15? Yeah, so far. Yeah, so 14. 14. And this, so far. And yeah. You've got a guy who's fought over, I think, like maybe 50 fights in Angla. And, um, yeah. and then, yeah, man, just dethroning him that way. Like, you know, what do you think about that, vic- that victory? And he, the thing is, he absolutely dominated Angla Sang from, from start to finish. Because his entire game plan was built around catching Angla San's kick. I'm sorry if I'm botching his name completely. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, his entire game plan was to catch his kicks and take him down. And that's exactly what he did. He got single legs, he got double legs, and he just pressed him up against the cage and he took him down. He, he just wore on him for those five rounds, you know. To, to wear on somebody with the ca- of the caliber as Angla Sang, he is, he has, his, his mentality has to be at a different level. Like his approach going into that fight, his mind going into that fight had to have been the best I, I've probably ever seen anybody go into a fight, you know, because it's not easy to do to somebody what he did to him. Absolutely. And, you know, with, mm-hmm. uh, with his potential and his age, I mean, he's not really that old at all. I think he's barely 30 mm-hmm. or like just yeah. 30. And um, do you think that this is someone that the UFC should look at seriously of getting in? Do you think he stands a chance against UFC's present middleweight and lightweight, light heavyweight division in terms of fight caliber. I think it's a different, I think it's a, in terms of fight caliber, absolutely. I definitely think he can hang with the top five in the UFC in that, in his weight division. On the other hand though, one championship has a slightly different rule set where they have things that they can do differently. Now you saw Demetrius mm-hmm. Johnson get kneed to the head and get knocked out on the ground. That was, and Demetrius Johnson is, is one fighter that is considered the best of all time. Right, so to see that happen to him at one championship, fight, fighters prepare for fights in a different way for a fight at one championship and in um, and in organizations that adopt the unified MMA rules, like the UFC, like Brave, like Bellator, where you can't knee a downed opponent, you know, where you can't mm-hmm. soccer kick an opponent. Yeah, so people people approach these fights very differently. But um, after seeing what he did to what he did to Ong, it was very it was very clear to me that he can definitely definitely hang with the people in the UFC in that top five of that light heavyweight division or the middleweight division. And when you look at the middleweight division, you see uh, his, you know, caliber of and skill when it comes to grappling and wrestling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, do you think that he could give Izzy a run for his money? Because I personally think that he can. Like, you know, when you, when you look at I definitely think the so. way he operates. I definitely you know? think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I definitely think so. Because Izzy is very, um, I love Izzy. He's got, you know, I, I can't doubt him just because of one bad fight. Right. Of course nobody not. can. No one can. And and the only and the only thing standing between him and that uh, light heavyweight division crown was the was the size difference because he was underweight. He was very underweight at the weigh-ins, and he was and and that was him being heavy at the weigh-ins, like like that was him with no weight cut, no nothing. So it was just a size. It, it was just a matter of the size difference. So when a guy as big as uh, the Ritter, he when he goes down to um, when he gets down to middleweight. I mean, you just saw what he did to Ong at uh, at uh, light heavyweight, right? So when you go down to middleweight, there's that power differential again. There's that size differential again. And he was and he was bigger than Ong. And Bong, and Ong's a very very big guy. It's not like he's a small guy. Absolutely. Right. So so this guy's frame, this guy's uh, style of fighting, and this guy's tenacity when he's when he's in the cage is, I I think to another level. You know, so I definitely think that he can hang with Izzy, but I don't know how he can hang with somebody with Izzy's striking ability. Because Absolutely. people often underestimate the fact that Izzy knows how to move around wrestlers. Right? 
Romero could have taken him down. He didn't because he wanted. To, he basically made it a dick measuring contest with him. Right? Mm-hmm. In the most uh, in the most literal sense, he wanted to see if he could stand and bang with him. Right. And that's exactly what happened. It's amazing, man. And you know, uh, speaking of people who, when you think of people and see if they can hang with the top people in their division. Uh, you know, I want mm-hmm. to talk about UFC 262, which is around the corner. With mm-hmm. you know, two weeks away from it. Yes. Personally, Mike Chandler. So yes. excited, and you know, obviously, yeah. there's the word around the block is, does Mike Chandler deserve a title shot after you know just one victory against Dan Hooker? Um, no, but in terms of Mike Chandler, the UFC did not sign Mike Chandler to have him on some nine fight win. Sorry, so, so, some nine fight deal where he stays in the company for long. He's 34 years old. Okay, he doesn't have a lot of time left um, in terms of his athletic prime, which I think he's just coming into right now because I saw him fight yeah. uh, Patricky Pitbull. I saw him fight Patricio Pitbull, and this was a little under two years ago, right? And you mm-hmm. see him come in and fuck Dan Hooker up the way he did. In one round. I felt bad okay. watching that. I now, felt so sad watching that. What makes that. this guy? <laughs> what makes? I felt very happy because I've always been a Mike Chandler fan. <laughs> one, but but one sec, I want to make everybody listen to a voice note that Mike Chandler sent me. I talk to him sometimes. So. Wait, no way. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, oh my Mike goodness, Chandler. that's awesome. Yeah. Man. So, I sent him a voice note because at the beginning of this new year, I um I was contemplating whether I should be fighting again. Um, I was going through a bad time in my life and I reached out to him and I said, Hey Mike, I just wanted to let you know that I was in a bit of a rut with training and things in my life started what and, and things in my life. I started watching some of your older motivational videos and your training videos and just looking at your content after a really long time. Now I wonder why I ever stopped or I did, or I just didn't pop up on my Instagram. I just wanted to tell you that I've got, a, I've got an, I've got a newfound energy and motivation to get after it. Uh, get after it every day, and it's thanks to the energy that you bring into life every you, you bring into life every single day, at least from what I've seen online. This is what he sent me. Now tell me if you can't hear this, okay? I'm gonna turn this up to full. Hey man, that's uh, some good stuff. I really appreciate that. Really, really appreciate the uh, the message. Glad you found the motivation. Glad you found your uh, your groove back, man. Keep on getting after it. Keep on working hard. Keep on believing that great things are gonna happen. And they will. I'll see you at the top. Tune into my fight January 23rd. Can't wait to go out there and get that first UFC win and then go get that belt. Be blessed. See ya. Did you hear that? Oh, that is amazing, dude. That is amazing. Exactly. Exactly. And you reach out to this guy and um, and he and he, and he's just the and he's just the nicest soul. You know, he's oh, he's just got the most crystal clear approach on how to on how to approach a fight because I reached out to him a little, a, a little later as well. And, uh, he sent me back a text. I, I asked him about, um, how he's dealing with uh, fighting somebody with the caliber uh, of Charles Oliveira, you know, who's so refined everywhere in, in, in every aspect of the, of, of the fight game. This is what he says to me. He is just another man. As a matter of fact, I'm a far superior man than he is. I'm not scared of it at all, but fear will always be there in a sense. Just accept it acknowledge it and know it can't be erased, but it can be harnessed through hard work and bulletproofing your mind. This is the kind of approach this guy is taking every time he walks into a fight, right? No matter who his opponent is, even if his opponent is somebody that's ranked 13th, even if his, even if he's fighting for a UFC title or a Bellator title, this is the kind of attitude that this guy walks in with. And come fight night, I've never seen Charles Oliveira be at a very big stage, right? Never seen him under big lights with the title shot. Never seen him, never seen him go five rounds. I've never seen him be tested like that in his life. He's only fought three round fights, but he's, he's fought them extremely well. He's, he's headlined, he's headlined very few UFC fight night bouts, but I get what you're saying. You know, that's, that's some people yeah. questioning if Charles Oliveira in the first place deserved to be there in that title mix over mm-hmm. Justin Gaethje. And, mm-hmm. um, I guess at this point, uh, people just want to see an, a new face in that lightweight mix. Uh, for for mm-hmm. for a very long time, I think people with people have just been using Khabib and someone else. There's always Khabib mm-hmm. and you know someone else for the past couple of years. So there's some fresh exactly, faces because in the mix at one point, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. At one point, it just becomes a big circle jerk of these five guys just each other, right? It's not. Um, it's not. It's very refreshing for somebody to see a new face, right? As you said right now, Charles Oliveira being that dark horse, being that. Um, being that entity, that, that that scary, quiet guy that doesn't really say anything to anybody. And you have this guy in Mike Chandler, probably the most American 
entity I've ever seen in my life. He's always he's he's always got the flag draped around him. He's always speaking in that he's always speaking in that accent of his that 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 southern or mid or mid um, midwestern midwestern accent exactly. So whenever so you see a guy with this sort of a persona with his skill set with his mindset with his with his arsenal of skills because he's not just an explosive wrestler right you, you clearly see that he's got hands he's got hands for days he's got good kicks he's got excellent takedown defense he's got excellent takedowns he's got excellent top control and you've never seen charles face somebody with that kind of top control before right ever you've never seen him face anybody with that sort of top control but charles is um, charles is top control himself and his grappling and his ability to uh, to reverse positions to transition from one position to another is extremely refined is extremely high so i feel that to succeed in this fight mike chandler needs to avoid any and every grappling exchange because um i i may be wrong come fight time i may be i i, I may be extremely wrong because i haven't um, i haven't seen uh, mike chandler fight somebody who is that high who who is that high caliber with that caliber sir yeah yeah with that ability and that deadliness and that when charles pulls off a submission he pulls off simple shit he doesn't pull off fancy i mean he's got one calf slicer in his life but he pulls off extremely um extremely tight guillotines extremely tight uh, rear naked chokes right so when he sinks in a choke you can see that it's it's a, it's a it's a black belt level squeeze it's not it's not something that justin gaethje does it's not something that khabib does khabib also uses a lot of power when he's submitting somebody he uses a lot of leverage but you see charles just squeezing somebody differently right and that's what makes him so deadly and mike being the smaller fighter in the fight physically smaller fighter in the fight he's um he's got he's he, you know he's, he's he's going to have a long night ahead of him but he can also make it an extremely short night and um you know honestly just like you just like you i for not just followed mike chala i don't think i followed him as um diligently as you did uh, but i did check out a lot of his videos mm-hmm. like the moment he was announced as a, a backup fighter for khabib uh, gaethje and i kind of did my research on the guy i like okay tell me what this guy is all about his training regimen a little bit obviously again not to the extent that you did um and you know you can tell someone by the way they present themselves to the people like you know like one thing that you really touched on is some he's he feels like a very relatable man right like you know you he doesn't he is. i feel like the on screen persona of michael chandler is pro, is probably very similar to the guy that he is when you actually meet him in person and um, basically what you see is what you get from him absolutely and in terms of uh, you know what a smart fight would be to make for from the ufc's point of view uh, i think we can all agree that mike chandler delivered a hell of a promo after dan after the dan hooker win he called out everyone that's mm-hmm. there to call out and um, you know as a former champ himself with that kind of experience and with a skill set uh, i think he'd be a great champ for the ufc to have and you know he's someone who can definitely sell at least to the american market so yeah like really looking forward to that fight and um, in mm-hmm. terms of other scrums to you know another matches to make um we're looking at a very delicate situation at, at the welterweight uh, scene right now because um <laughs> yeah you know obviously we had this podcast discussing what's going to happen to usman masvidal to initially predicted a third round knockout then i changed my stance to a fourth now a fourth round knockout you said that it's going to go to decision um and i mm-hmm. think all of us are just proven wrong and i think the one thing that we both said which was very accurate uh, based on the results of that fight is kamaru usman is usman winning deadlier by the fight and you know the levels that this man is just operating in is something else and um there was a interview that uh, ali abdul aziz did yesterday i think with ariel helwani where yeah. um ali abdul aziz dismissed a kobe fight when dana white and you know ufc management very clearly mentioned this well before the masvidal fight that you know regardless of what the results are because usman Co- covington 2 is going to be a huge draw without a doubt Uh, and mm-hmm. if masvidal won the title masvidal coming to would be an equally big draw you know like you know people are going to be paying to watch that fight and mm-hmm. either way either way you see it kobe covington is in that mix he's a guy who arguably won two to three rounds in in their first contest someone who who could withstand the power of usman obviously we're talking about something that happened two years ago right of course 
uh, Usman's boxing technique, his striking has just improved exponentially since then. Um, yeah. But, you know, people have been talking about different things. You know, there's Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz where people are saying that the winner of that fight uh, could get Usman. Usman himself has been open to the idea of fighting Nick Diaz, for example. Um, the Diaz brothers, either way you see it, huge draw, whatever bout they're in. You know, I don't think anyone else mm-hmm. could get a five-round co-main non-title bout if they weren't Conor McGregor or Nate Diaz or one of the Diaz brothers. Um, yeah. When, when people are talking about how, you know, Edwards winning could propel him up there as well because uh, Leon Edwards <clears throat> lost to Kamaru Usman, I think in Usman's uh, first pro UFC fight. Like that's when Usman beat Leon Edwards. I think it was his second fight. I think it, I think it was his second fight, not his... Not, not right. his first well, for The first or the second, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, in, his, yeah. in the beginning, Leon Edwards has come a long mm-hmm. way. Hasn't... Bilal fight didn't exactly go the way all of us hoped to. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, people are talking about who should come, you know, in, in that... Who should... What the pecking order should actually be. Personally, mm-hmm. I do not think that you that there's any sense in writing off Kobe Covington. He's he made easy work of Tyron Woodley. Uh, both um, Gilbert Burns and Usman took Woodley to uh, decision. He finished him mm-hmm. and you know he walked away yeah. like you know he, he just fought like a fifteenth ranked person or like a twentieth rank uh, or, or like an unranked yeah. fighter. That's the level that Kobe mm-hmm. was at. I think with his new training yeah, he made camp it look easy. and with his new training yeah. partners He's someone who's also just been getting better. Someone who can draw a fight. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the winner of Edwards and Nate can most certainly get the fight after that. But um, yeah, I I don't think you can write off Kobe. Uh, What do you think? I don't think anybody can write off Kobe Covington either. I think that um, in order to let uh, Usman... Usman's looking to face Michael Kia, so I'm going to get to that in a minute. (laughs) <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm gonna get I'm, I'm gonna get to that in a minute because that fight makes little to no sense. Okay, um, but uh, I think that Colby Covington should definitely be in line for the title shot next. Um, I don't see why Leon Edwards should face Nate Diaz because they say that the winner of that fight gets to face Usman for the title. For the title, there is no way in this world I ever see a guy like Nate Diaz being a champion of the welterweight division. <laughs> that but that doesn't it 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 doesn't um, keep him from getting title shots. But that's just my opinion on it. Leon Edwards has forever been the welterweight divisions um, the welterweight divisions dark horse. Like Charles Oliveira has been the dark horse of the lightweight division. Um, Leon Edwards has been consistently very systematically beating all of his opponents. Right, he's got some of the most refined technique for a southpaw that I've ever seen in my life. Right. Everything he does is so crystal clear. Everything he does is so calculated. And everything everything he does is so thought out. Because I see some of his training footage as well at Renegade Jiu-Jitsu in Birmingham uh, on their Instagram page. And there's very simple shit that he does. But he just does it extremely well. Right, And these simple things have carried him a long, long, long way in that welterweight division. So I think that he makes easy work of Nate Diaz. Okay, This is my opinion. I might be wrong. Mm-hmm. Because we saw what happened with Connor, with, 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 with Connor and Diaz the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, there's no there's no way in hell I would give the title shot to anybody except Colby Covington at this point because he has proven himself time and time again. He has um, he has although he's been although he speaks like an asshole. That's just the front that he puts up. Absolutely, absolutely. He's, open, he's just... openly admitted that he's he's open he's openly admitted that outside he's a very respectful he's a very uh, he's, he's a very respectful uh, person and he's an incredibly good fighter. And he's a very diligent and disciplined fighter, right? It takes a different kind of mentality to be the way he is, to fuck Robbie Lawler up the way he did, to make Tyron Woodley look like a B-League fighter, to make somebody as as scary as Kamaru Usman lose rounds to him, right? He lost the first two rounds for sure until he got finished in the fourth one. That's different because Kamaru Usman's jab is just something straight out of hell. But um, yeah, you have a guy in him who made Rafael Dos Anjos look like he didn't he didn't belong in there with him. Right? Who does that to Rafael Dos Anjos? Dos Anjos was the lightweight champion of the world. He made Anthony Pettis. He, he dominated Anthony Pettis for so long. And Anthony Pettis ran through that world division for very long as well. The only person that we haven't seen challenge for that title in a while is uh, Stephen Thompson. 
But again, I was he actually about to bring him up. Yeah. Yeah. And and even the setbacks again, that he had, had weren't setback. weren't they weren't mm-hmm. you know um, in fact I don't know how how much you can actually look at that as setback setbacks because when you look at the the history of title fights that we've seen so far right you saw a a mm-hmm. very very one sided victory when Usman beat Woodley for the title um, even though that was a closely contested match against Covington he still managed to break his jaw and drop him in the fifth decision to Usman mm-hmm. uh, Masvidal KO Masvidal KO Gilbert Burns, Wonderboy. On the other hand, uh, he fought prime T Wood, and um, mm-hmm. and he still took Woodley to a draw, and even then won. Like Woodley won a majority decision at the end of the day, mm-hmm. and you you can't yeah. really put that as a blemish on Wonderboy's record ever. You can't ever go like, oh yeah, yeah I you mean, can't. You, you were a, you know, it was it was more of, it was less of him being really unskilled or like you know. Leagues below more than you know, T would probably just being a shade better, right? Yeah. And um, styles make matchups. Too. St- styles make matchups over there, and uh, because and because Woodley is such a dominant wrestler, and because he's got that right hand from hell, it makes him that much more deadly in terms of being able to land something big on Stephen Thompson and putting him out. Whereas Thompson has usually touched guys on their chins using timing, using speed, using agility, stuff like that to beat. To beat, okay, leading up to that fight, uh, Stephen Thompson really hadn't beaten guys like Darren Woodley. Everybody say hi to Aria. Hi. Hey, what's up? Hi, wait, what's up? <laughs> hi, that's my little sister. Yeah. Hi. Mm-hmm. The yeah. Southpaw. <laughs> so, yeah, the Southpaw, yeah. <laughs> you're a Southpaw, you're a lefty. This is coming all on the podcast. Okay, never mind. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, you talk about. So, the people that Stephen Thompson had beaten in the lead-up to that fight were not the caliber of Woodley, right? He beat somebody like Jake Allenberger. He beat some, and, and Jake Allenberger was well out of his prime when he did beat him. Right? Because that knockout, I think, was one of the scariest things I've seen. Because his leg came up from... I, I don't know what ballet... He, I, I don't know whether he had experience in ballet or just because his, um, his experience in karate was so, was, so exten- was, was so extensive and it was so refined and he had all these... Um, kickboxing fights, and he's had, and he was undefeated, and he was undefeated coming into these fights. And his style was just so attractive to strikers that it was hard to deny him that title shot. But we all know that styles make matchups, and Woodley is good everywhere, was good everywhere, right? You see, um, Kamaru Usman. Now, people people spoke about the welterweight division in a very bad light when Woodley was the champion because. Those, in my opinion, as in my opinion as well, were incredibly boring title defenses, right? You saw them give him 36-year-old Damian Maya in his second title defense, right? Where all he did was sprawl and box with him, sprawl and box with him, and beat him like that for five rounds. He got two main events, and the pay-per-view buys were almost negligible because people just didn't want to see those fights. So when people saw Kamaru Usman be given that shot, people called Kamaru Usman very boring in terms of. Um, in terms of his fighting style, we know now that he dominates the fuck out of people, and he makes he makes that domination look extremely exciting. So it's not like he's doing so. So it's not like he's bum rushing people and holding them against the cage and doing nothing. No, he's dominating. He's constantly pop shotting you. He's constantly wearing on you. He's constantly making you tired. And then when you're tired, that's when he does the stuff that he's not as proficient at, which is his striking. So his striking looks that much better. And that takes a different breed of champion to do. Because he knows what he's good at. And then he'll use what he's not good at and what you're good at to beat you. You saw him in the fourth round against Tyron Woodley, outboxing him. He made him stand against the cage, stand square against the cage, and just throw the most basic punches and throw the most basic looking punches on his face, on his body. He kicked him in the leg. Kamaru Usman never throws leg kicks. He was doing shit like that to Tyron Woodley. Right. So he's exciting in a very different way. In a very educated MMA uh, enthusiast's eyes, you can see the beauty of that. But for the people that don't understand, it takes a different kind of champion to beat somebody in many, many different ways over the period of a fight. Because he even said this in an interview where he said that I don't just want to dominate the person. I want to break the person. I want to be so much better than that person at everything that I do that unless I feel like I'm about to kill him, I'm not satisfied. That unless he doesn't succumb to everything that I do, 
it's not it's it's, it's not a win so you're me. just beating him so you're winning not, is you're not just enough being the better wrestler you're not yeah. just being the better wrestler but you're mm-hmm. just being the overall better fighter and i think uh, you know when it, it comes down to exactly what you said right because once he did that to woodley woodley's just been on a slippery slope since then right and um, he's just gone down multiple times he's been on a four fight losing streak uh, and you never got cut from the ufc dude person. right so um yeah it's it's it's, it's fairly sad to see what one loss to usman can do to you and uh, fair to say that's kind of what happened to uh, masvidal as well right because we saw masvidal come off of uh, a very good three fight win streak right especially after yep. getting that tko win over nate diaz getting into a fight with uh, usman lost to decision then gets knocked out you know i want to see where mm-hmm. uh, life takes masvidal next I, i really hope he still you know at least finishes his career on a high i think he's got a couple of years left maybe like you know two or three mm-hmm. if you're being optimistic and i really mm-hmm. you know want this man to go out on a high and i think he's also such um, an exemplary fighter uh, talks trash mm-hmm. and what not but you know at the end of the day he's someone who who's got that respect as well no matter how much trash he talks and mm-hmm. um, yeah i honestly as an usman fan you know he's someone like you know obviously i'm way newer to this than you are you know just like many others started uh, watching this just you know last year but um when you see a guy like usman perform cuz like usman pretty much got into the free just as i started watching watching you know ufc so i've been following you know how he was like the reigning def- you know reigning defending champion when i came into the ufc to find out who the champions are what do they do let's explore their right. past fights you know and um, this is a guy who has never been afraid of anything and the moment you see someone like ali abdul aziz make an excuse for usman the moment you see usman talking about how he's already lapped around people so he doesn't want to lap around coming or kobe covington where he talks about maybe fighting nate diaz or wonder boy i don't like to see that as a fan that's 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 just that's just <laughs> downright disrespectful yeah. you're putting everyone that you've inspired down because here's the thing right lapping around the top 5 isn't bad like in fact it tells you that hey you're you know you can keep up with the times that you've ev- now earlier you were a better fighter and now you've evolved more than these guys and nothing stands testament to your greatness as much as that does unless it means going yeah. up a division which he won't while he's the champ and um, yeah. i think that's the only thing that's left for him but there is no way you can just write off a, a, a covington rematch you know even if you don't fight wonder boy mm-hmm. right like cuz let's face it mm-hmm. i feel like you know wonder boy usman might have been a fight to make i i feel like it might have been the a uh, better fight to make maybe 3 years ago as opposed to now uh just considering like wonder boy's activity as well you know he hasn't been the yeah. most active fighter on the roster right um yeah, very true but i mean so yeah and i think that kind of wraps up that whole segment i really hope he signs the dotted line for kobe he said he wants to fight in june and uh, i don't know how he's mm-hmm. going to do that but he uh, he did walk away from that whole fight without a scratch so um you know <laughs> one thing i do want to say before we move forward with uh, move forward with this or end this episode um i wanted to say one thing about how much the sport has evolved in terms of um in terms of how winning is not enough anymore right you brought up the fact about uh, tyron woodley tyron woodley's credit diminishing uh, after the usman fight i think it was happening way before that in that damian maya fight so just because somebody is winning doesn't necessarily mean that they're leveling up what kamaru usman over, is trying to do over here is um, lap around these fighters beat these people that are in that top 5 that are in that top 10 that are exciting names just because it was such a spectacle when he knocked out masvidal wasn't it absolutely right because people are talking about how boring he was so it's now become about credibility it's now become about how good i am not the fact that i'm good fuck that people know i'm very good right but i want to show people how good i am how much better then they think that i am already when um when when Darren Woodley fought Damian Maya you saw a very deflated Darren Woodley when you saw Darren Woodley fight um, even Steven Thompson the second time before the Damian Maya fight he seemed like a very he seemed like he didn't want that fight it seemed like he didn't want to be the champion and then you saw him complete get completely destroyed against Kamaru Usman now this these are the qualities you want to see in a champion that's why george saint pierre like he was always 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 looking to improve even outside training camp he was always traveling to thailand learning how to throw spinning back kicks learning how to throw elbows correctly learning how to throw knees properly kamaru usman is doing that in terms of these fights he's fighting everybody he's fighting often 
and he's making and he, and he's putting on good shows that's what you want that's what i would want to see from a champion now in terms of being a fan of the you know of this of the ufc and of that welterweight division it's not about beating the best guys because you can beat the top 5 guys but sometimes the, but, but sometimes the guys the guy that's ranked 8th is usually better than the guys that, uh, the guys that's ranked and more active than the guys that's ranked number 2 and activity counts which makes usman such a special very well deserved pound number 1 pound for pound fighter in the world for sure because he's taking on these smaller names these guys that are far more active than he is these guys that um and he's beating them in every single way not just in terms of skill his skill is far better than everybody's okay maybe not maybe not his hands in terms of how i mean masvidal is forever known as one of the best boxers in that division for a very long time you saw exactly what happened to him right now he made he made masvidal think that he was going for a shot but then boom right hand that's all it took for him right so you see him people beating people at their own game you see him beating everybody you see him beating people often and you see him dominating the people that say that he can't beat right. that say that he can't beat them in colby covington now why i think he's taking this breather between the colby covington fight and um and this next fight that he's taking or i i can't call mm-hmm. it a breather he's facing michael kiesa although <laughs> it doesn't although it doesn't make sense that he's fighting michael kiesa i see why he's doing it he must be doing that he must be doing it for the activity because michael kiesa has a different body type because he's got a different skill set because michael kiesa has been has been extremely active he has been extremely dominating in his last three fights right so for usman to cement himself as a champion he's doing things differently you tell me one champion that's doing that that's facing literally everybody in his weight class apart from israel adesanya fair fair enough fair enough i think i think that's a strong point there like you know just giving people yeah. that hope that hey you can still fight the champ you know mm-hmm. and i think in that's that, yeah, that that's i'm a reliable champion point. yeah yeah exactly that you that, are someone that i'm a fights, reliable you know? look at mm-hmm. me fight yeah yeah i think i think the closest some people that the, the closest person to do that was also bones mm-hmm. uh you know when he, when he was reigning yeah, the lightweight division in, he in fought the, everyone that stood you know he he in 2019 he fought the four fights yeah and yeah. um you know speaking about john jones you know um there was you know <laughs> <laughs> today's fight was extremely interesting when it comes down to Dominic Reyes you know a man that many people argue argued that won his previous scrum with um, John Jones in 2020 no he didn't that, i'll tell you why he didn't like, i'll tell like, you why after i don't know i'm just saying like uh, no, no, no 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 i was just saying that you know many people mm-hmm. argued that point saying that you know that was an mm-hmm. incredibly close match up Dominic Reyes deserved to win and for a lot of people when you know this this man who who then went from 12 and 0 to 12 and 1 a lot of people were like hey you know what this is just like again similar to how wonderboy lost to goodly it's just a minor blemish in your record like it's not even something you should be ashamed of or sad about like people thought this is a guy Absolutely. that you know yeah. bones bones might be one of the very few people to put that loss in his call put that put that loss call make that loss call him active for him right and then he mm-hmm. went on again you know again deservedly went up against jan blahovic for that vacant title and again mm-hmm. got put out like this is a guy who took jones to decision and then gets knocked out by blaho which is polish power and then arguably i think this year this might have been one of the most stylistic knockouts <laughs> by by you definitely Prohaska. i um mm-hmm. you know even just just watching that fight you know there's a huge part of me that really just wanted to see someone like tommy kreis get that win but then again Prohaska has finished 24 of his 27 wins. That's not a small number. Like that, yeah, that should is a scary very high finish rate. Like, uh, mm-hmm. and to think that a lot of people didn't even rate. consider yeah. this man to be that kind of threat. And you saw it the moment this person was given that limelight to to main event a UFC fight card. He showed people mm-hmm. what he's worth. He showed people why he belongs in that main event every show from now on. Like. you either put him in a championship yeah. bout or you put him in a main event but either way he deserves that limelight and i even as a person so composed so calm so genuinely nice and you know humble even after such yeah. a victory no taunting nothing just straight up you know i don't even know what to say man like he's you, know, you see that kind of behavior and you just like damn that's the kind of champion that the people deserve you know with a record yeah. to back it up as well so um 
you know, what do you think about his knockout? And of course, you were talking about why Dominic Reyes didn't win. But like, you know, if you could share your thoughts mm-hmm. on the fight, on Dominic Reyes, um, you know, winning or losing, or how you felt he didn't deserve the win. Yeah. And most importantly, what happens to Dominic Reyes next? Uh, that last question is a little hard to answer because we've seen guys who have been former champions like Tyron Woodley get cut from the UFC for a couple of losses, right? But um, that's the UFC's way of ironing out the div- uh, ironing out the roster and only keeping the best, right? The, only the fittest will survive. The UFC is the one percent of the one percent of fighters in the world. So if that's there's no true. place for a guy like Tyron Woodley, I um, I'm honestly quite afraid for. For Dominic Reyes' is, um, future in the UFC, given his current losing streak. Although I hope it doesn't happen. I really hope and pray it doesn't happen. I um, There's no ruling that out. But uh, Dominic Reyes' uh, loss to John Jones, I think, was definitely a loss. It was, a, it was definitely a very close loss. Okay, I'll give him Absolutely. that because he definitely yeah. won those first two rounds. Mm-hmm. He definitely won those first two rounds. Um, in the third, fourth, and the fifth round. Fifth rounds. Um, John Jones controlled him in the clinch in that third round more often than um, Dominic Reyes was letting up shots. Okay, and landing punches under the unified MMA rules is not um, does not score more points than a takedown. So if you get a takedown at the end of the round, which is exactly what John Jones did, two and a half minutes into the fight, John Jones started attempting takedowns. So he was getting cage control time. He was getting um, he was getting shots off in the in the clinch. And towards the end of the rounds, he got in the in the fourth round, he got one takedown at the end of the round, which won him the round for sure, because the striking in the fourth and fifth rounds was extremely close. But uh, the takedowns were the differential over there. And uh, in the fifth round, he just kept racking up the takedowns. He just kept taking him down. Although Reyes just kept getting back up, takedown score points. So John Jones did exactly what he needed to to win that fight, not to dominate in that fight, because he definitely didn't dominate in that fight. Right. And that's but you still, and, 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 but he still clearly won. Like you know, you're still, it was a he still very clearly won victory, the fight, but very close yeah. victory. Yeah, yeah, it was a very, very close victory. But it was, it was very, um, it was clear that he won, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no doubt that he won in my mind, but he didn't win decisively like he usually did, like against Anthony Smith, right? right? He decisively beat him over over five rounds, although he right. got illegally knee to the head. Uh, Anthony Smith decided to continue fighting and um, and eventually lost the fight. Okay, probably so that, you could still, more the you can still say that you know there there is a little asterisk you know, asterisk over that particular win. Uh, the you know especially against the one with that and Thiago Santos like just you know a sheet you know just a little bit of. So you but see, I mean you're, you're bound to have that. I mean you've got a career that's like 26 wins and 26 27 wins and come on you, you that, can't. Dude. You've got guys that have been preparing for you. You've got guys that have been preparing specifically for you. You were ranked pound for pound number one in the world for the longest time. There are guys in every corner of the world that are looking to train according to your fighting style. Right? They're exactly. making micro adjustments to your micro adjustments. So you have, to right. make, you have to make that many more micro adjustments to be unpredictable, to get better. Because for there's sure. that target on your back. Right? So it's not that John Jones is diminishing. It's just that these guys are getting so fucking good that they mm-hmm. forced John Jones to go into the heavyweight division and fight this fight um, or prepare for this fight against Francis Ngannou. Right. right. So it's not John Jones being dominant for a long time and then losing his abilities. It's not him losing his abilities. It's people making these micro adjustments. It's people understanding where they can have this guy, where they can have this guy's number, where they can catch him in, in because it's a game of inches. At the end of it, when you step into the cage, it's you reacting to what you've done in training. So these guys have been, so if John Jones throws a jab, these guys have drilled to slip the jab, go to the body, kick his legs, try to take him down, try, try, try to clinch with him, make micro adjustments like that around his game plan. Right? So you don't see greats diminishing. And that's where I feel like Kamaru Usman is just so many levels above everybody because he's got this target on his back, but he's just so fucking unpredictable. He gets so much better over time. He does things where people think he's bad, what people think he's bad at. And he makes them look stupid. That's, that's the best part, right? Like, because in that fight, um, yeah. you know, Jorge said that he just trained for takedowns. But the moment Usman exactly. took him down, Jorge looked so comfortable. But then he never in a thousand re- years realized that he was going to get clocked out in the next couple of minutes by a simple one-two combo. 
Like, you know, yeah. it's like you said, I think and it was just, just he, power he, of he got the jab. He got the jab. He didn't even land the jab. He got the jab. He, uh, he pulled the jab down. And when he thought that he was going for a takedown, Masvidal sort of leaned into it and tried to shoot his hips backwards. And boom, right hand. That's all it takes, man. And, and yeah. no doubt that <laughs> Usman's got a fucking rock for a hand. He's not, he's, he's uh, rock for a fist. He's not even got a fucking fist. I don't, I don't think he's made of bones. I think he's made of adamantium, like what Wolverine's made of. Too. <laughs> I don't, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, when you have to talk about uh, Yuri Prohaska's um, win. Oh yeah, Prohaska, um, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Like, I think, I think, yeah. I think we're both such big fans that I think every co- we can kind of find a way to just talk, bring up Usman in every conversation. Uh, that, that's how much you know, he's a he's one person you can never stop talking about without a doubt. But Absolutely. um, you yeah. know, kind of just looking at the decisive win which he finished Dominic Reyes, who by no accounts is a, a fifth or an eighth ranked fighter. He's he, he was in the top three. You know, he he's fought two title fights, and you made it look yeah. like this, this is someone that. He almost made it look like the rules are reversed. Like, you know, Prohaska was someone who was in the top two or was the number one contender who put down like a like an eighth-ranked fighter, you know? And uh, so, what do you think about that finish? And do you think that with with such a rec- with his current fighting style, after yeah. uh, Jan Teshra, do you think that this is someone who has the capability of becoming the champion? Because I genuinely think he, he does. Um, like, again, it brings up the same point of the evolution of the sport because this guy moves like a bantamweight. I was speaking to my friend Balakrishna about this recently. He's a UFC, he's a Hindi UFC commentator. Uh, right. I was speaking to him about this this morning when uh, uh, after the fight finished, and uh, he told me that he told me, and even I agreed with him that um, Prohaska moves like a fucking bantamweight, dude. No light heavyweight in history has ever moved like that, besides Dominic Reyes. This guy was doing laps of Dominic Reyes. In the mm-hmm. octagon, this guy was outstriking uh, Dominic Reyes because he's got unpredictable strikes. Because he's got mars- he's got the traditional martial martial artist type spinning kicks. He's got um, he throws spinning elbows. Clearly, as we saw him knock um, Dominic Reyes out with, right? So his unpredictability is what won him this fight. Because everybody in these higher weight divisions has a very predictable fighting style, right? It's not everybody's not as nimble. Every so uh, you're, you're either a long rangey fighter. You're either a wrestler or you're either a power, or you're either a power puncher, right? When you mix up power, when you mix up uh, athleticism, when you mix up uh, things like skill and um, and vision, okay? Not not a lot of uh, light heavyweights or uh, middleweights or heavyweights have that sort of vision. This guy sees punches coming and is slipping them like Roy Jones Jr. He's mm-hmm. get, going in the pocket and fighting like Mike Tyson, right? And um, he's throwing elbows like Boakao. He's throwing elbows like Sand. Sancha, he's throwing knees like fucking, um, what's his name? Um, Pech Pan Manong. So he does everything extremely well and he moves like fuck, he moves like Zabit, he moves like a light heavyweight Zabit. Who does that? Mm-hmm. Nobody. Nobody. And I think that he definitely, he is the one person I feel in that entire light heavyweight division that will definitely and most certainly pose the biggest threat to Jan Bohovic when he does, when he does challenge for that title. And you're confident that Jan Blahovic is someone who's going to be defending his stuff, who's going to come out champion when he fights Glover Teixeira? Absolutely. Glover Teixeira is out of his, out of his prime. Blahovic is a very young, very new champion and he's got that hunger. Okay, he recently had a kid. And um, uh, for people that don't know Dominic, uh, sorry, uh, what's his name? Uh, Blahovic. Blahovic's wife, who's also his manager, cornered him for that fight. She was seven months pregnant walking into his corner. Walking with him into his corner. Yeah. Okay. And, um, um, and two months after that fight, they had their son. So he has this new... F- and, and when he beat Izzy, the first thing he said was he, he, attribu- he attributed that win to his son. Right? So you see mm-hmm. this newfound fire under this guy's ass, under this amazing champion's... Um, you, you see this fire in this amazing champion's life and you see um, a young up-and-comer in, um, in uh, Yuri ba- uh, Prohaska that can, that, 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 that can definitely beat and make adjustments around these very generic fighting styles. Okay? Because he's fought power punchers before, beaten them, knocked them out. He's fought grapplers before, avoided the grappling, finished them. 
right? So this is one guy that knows how to finish people. This, this is one guy that knows how to be and how to make adjustments and just be himself at the same time. Because sometimes people can't make those adjustments and end up, and end up, and end up not fighting like themselves. Uh, case in point, Masvidal. Yeah. He made adjustments that, that made him look not like himself. And you see what happened to him, right? He was preparing for the day because he looked extremely comfortable on the ground. Good, exactly. Against, uh, yeah, against Usman. But when it came to the striking, he got clocked in the jaw and got knocked out, right? So, uh, Prohaska's ability to be himself is what sets him apart from all these different light heavyweights. Absolutely. So, I think that um, nice. Bahovic wins, wins his title defense against Teixeira. And um, um, I think that um, if anybody has a good chance of beating Bahovic, it'll be Prohaska, for sure. It's awesome, man. And uh, speaking of yep. predictions, uh, I'd definitely like to wrap up this segment with UFC 262 predictions. <laughs> uh, not not yep. as, uh, I guess, not, not as stacked as the 261 card was. But if you look at the top three mm-hmm. bouts, um, you know, we're, we're kicking things off with Benil Darush and uh, Tony Ferguson. Uh, who do you think takes that? I... I want to give the benefit of the doubt to uh, Dariush for trying to pull off something spectacular, but I think it's it's obvious who's going to win that fight just because of the more dynamic skill set. I mean, Dariush, I know that he fights like I know that he fights extremely hard, but he fights against guys that are willing to stand in the pocket with him and trade. Tony Ferguson will piece you to he'll he'll piece you to a pulp if you let him do that. And Dariush doesn't have the best. Um, he, he doesn't have the best footwork. He doesn't have the best defense. He's a very st- he's, a, he's a very stand and bang, stand and brawl with you kind of kind of fighter, and that and that works against him. Against the, right. it, it makes for a very exciting matchup for sure. Two guys that are willing to throw down for nothing. Right? There's nothing on the line. There's only reputation on the line in this fight. Right? It's Tony that needs a win, which is why they've given him a guy like Dariush. Right? They've not given him somebody in the top five. Anyway. Uh, I think that Tony wins that fight. And uh, wh- what's the co-main event? To oh, this? the Kone, the co-main oh, event Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards, Nate Diaz. Uh, Leon so, Edwards, uh, Diaz. Yeah, Nate Diaz, yeah. I think Edwards wins that fight because he's better than Diaz everywhere, even in terms of jiu-jitsu. But if Diaz is to win that fight, I definitely think that he's going to win that fight by submission against Leon Edwards. Uh, but if Leon Edwards wins that fight, I think he's going to dominate him over five rounds or... Um, I, see, Nate Diaz is not somebody that gets finished, right? So, uh, Leon Edwards is going to have to be able to wear on Nate Diaz, tire him out. I know that these guys don't get tired, but he has to make him, he has to make him work. And um, I don't know how, I don't know how well Leon Edwards is going to deal with the pace that Nate Diaz can keep because I've never seen him get tested that way, except against Kamaru Usman and Kamaru beat him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, uh, I, I think that uh, Leon Edwards takes that fight by a decision, if at all he does win. If it goes Nate Diaz's way, it's going to come by submission for sure. Or by TKO. And the main event, I'm going to have to go with my boy Mike Chandler. You know, For no other reason apart from the fact that he is walking into this mentally, physically, spiritually prepared for this fight. In addition to having a very deadly, very um, explosive and very, and very deceptively powerful uh, arsenal of skills. Although Charles Oliveira does uh, pose an extremely, um, how should I say this? Although he does pose an extremely uh, menacing, very scary skill set, a very well-rounded skill set. Like he's good everywhere. He's never out of position. He's never doing something the wrong way. He's never, he's never struggling to get position. He's always slicing through somebody's guard like butter. He's always taking somebody down extremely seamlessly. Everything he does is extremely clean. But Mike Chandler is very good is a very good fighter at not making you look so good you know what i mean like some guys right. some fighters right. look like world beaters yeah but mike chandler is somebody that makes you look who's that that makes you look like not such a good fighter makes sense so i think the fact that uh, so i think the fact that olivera is not going to be able to dominate him the way he's dominated um, everybody else so far is um, is going to be uh, the only thing that hands down probably moves. the biggest fight in Oliveira's career I think till now so um, yeah 100% yeah. and if we're yeah. going to go at it top down I'm going to call a second round TKO slash KO uh, for Mike Chandler mm-hmm. uh, I think he's proven that he can Same do here. that I, and you know uh, for what it's worth 
Oliveira has had that history of either uh, he's not someone who just goes for he's not a decision winner or a loser. He's um, yeah. you know he either gets taken down or he takes them down. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to call for an early finish. Uh, if if it happens either way, I think it's going to happen either. I feel like whatever happens is going to happen in the second round. But I want to predict a Mike right. Chandler win. Um, I think just as highlighted by you, I think the possibilities of future matchups with Mike Chandler is extremely exciting. He's excellent on the mic. Um, he gets people behind him. I think every purist would rally behind a champion like Mike, Ch- uh, Mike Chandler because, you know, uh, he's just absolutely inspiring. You're, he's someone that you'd want to see go out on top. You know, he's at that stage in his career where you want Definitely. to tell your kids about Mike Chandler, right? So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know how relevant that point is, but like, you know, it's just, uh, like, it's just something <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you're, you're always... It's, it's what makes you want like him that, to be a champion. Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's what makes you want him to be a champion. And want to see him um, wear that crown. I mean, he's got the persona of a king, right? Sure. You want to see a king succeed. Yeah. And um, I think I stand with you. I mean, that's the only. Uh, I think our predictions are pretty much the same, except that I'm going to try and be a little more specific, just because why the fuck not? Because right? as a speculating fan, no, that's, what, that's what I do. You yeah. know, I'm 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm that guy. So uh, yeah. I think the one place where I'll damn straight, straight on agree with you is that Leon Edwards, just given his career like has also been has won a majority of fights with fire decision and um, you know obviously Nate Diaz was the only reason he didn't continue fighting Masvidal is because the doctor said no like he he's someone who would go in without an eye into a fight because that's just the yeah. kind of man he is it's the reason why people love yeah. watching him fight um, so yeah I think that that's a decision win for Leon Edwards but if he knocks Nate Diaz out I think there's a very, very strong argument as to why he might deserve a title shot because that's something that not a lot of people really do. Uh, and I'm talking about like no mm-hmm. doctor stoppage, none of that. If he gets a clean TKO or a KO, that's it'd be very hard to deny Edwards uh, a future title. And yeah, absolutely. while Kobe Covington and Usman is something that should be done without a doubt, maybe, maybe Edwards winning in an iconic fashion against um, Maza, against uh, Nate Diaz could just punch him over because you know the last fight that they had was years ago. You know, it's you want to see these two yeah. evolved fighters run it back. And uh, yeah. I think lucky number three, hopefully for Tony Ferguson, he um, he did go up against you know really really well established fighters. He went up against Charles Oliveira, and, uh, you know Justin Gagey. Justin Gagey. Uh, if if you're looking at it as a curve, right? Like as a person who started somewhere here, like he got knocked out by Gagey. Ran it to a decision, mm-hmm. so like he's it's still better than getting knocked out. And yeah. I, think, I think a win over um Darwish is something that can give him some confidence back. In all honesty, I don't see him fighting for the title anytime soon or you know before the end of his career. He's a big name, mm-hmm. but you know, yeah. I don't think he's at uh, to get through to the title, he's gonna have to face. People like Conor McGregor would be an excellent stylistic matchup. He'd probably have to uh, face Justin Gagey again, maybe. Um, and, you know, or, or a number of others are probably just lying back there in the lightweight division and see if he can still get back to some form of dominance. I think he'd at least have to have two to three wins in that column before challenging for a title fight. Love to see. Mm-hmm. I would love to see that for Tony, you know, who wouldn't. He's um, he's a true mm-hmm. fighter in every sense of it. You know, he's never yeah, backed down from a challenge, never uh, mm-hmm. never made excuses. Like you know, what more do you want? So um, exactly. Yeah, let's you're gonna call for, but more specifically, I want to be very bold here and say Tony takes this in the first round. I'm gonna be extremely bold. Really? Because you know, I'm I'm gonna be extremely bold. I I'll tell you why. Because yeah. I held back. I held back for that Usman thing. Thinking third round. I'm not doubting myself anymore. Yeah. I'm really not. As, as insane as my predictions can get, shit, some of them have turned out to be true. I called I yeah. called Khabib taking KG down in the second when everyone was like, oh yeah, KG is going to like run him to like the third or fourth. Knock and I was out, like, yeah. no, he takes him down in the second. Boom. Dustin Dustin knocks out corner. Boom. Like, you know, man, I've been on a roll. I was like, and I was like, yeah. Masvidal gets knocked out. <laughs> Boom, that happened. So, uh, <laughs> like, I'm really yeah. not going to doubt myself as much. And if if this happens, Dana White better get me mm-hmm. on board as a UFC commentator. I'm fucking like, if I'm going to be calling yeah, shots, like, yeah, dude. this gets on true. Yeah. Like, hell, you need someone like me <laughs> getting people hyped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. With all that yeah, exactly. IP of money, they can afford to get a clown. So, <laughs> fuck yeah, dude. I'm going to buy a steak. Uh, 
I'm, I'm going to buy a share in the UFC now, depending on what the rate just is. Just because, <laughs> just because nobody cares where the share yeah. price is going. Just you're just going to yeah. buy, buy, you know, if Bilal Mohamed's doing it, you're doing it. So yeah, yeah man, shit. It was an interesting episode. Um, and I love the level of detail that you shared because, you know, the, that's what needs to get out there, man, at the end of the day. We, we, you, yeah, we discuss absolutely. The more you talk and the more details you get to share mm-hmm. and the more people like me, including myself, get educated about it. And hopefully those who are watching about it who, I mean, those who are watching get educated about it as well. So thank mm-hmm. you so much for joining in and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Make sure you tune in to UFC 262 free promo. Don't stream it. Wink, wink. So, <laughs> nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. If Dana White's watching, just to the end from here. So, we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm-hmm.